start here. All right, welcome everyone uh, to the Urban Ecology Collaborative, our November uh, meeting. Uh, we're joined today by Dr. Cecil Konenendijk. Did I get that right? I was practicing before. I hope so. You did a great, you did a great job, David. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is David Meshulam. Uh, I'm co-chair of the Urban Ecology Collaborative here, and uh, really thrilled to have uh, Cecil join us today. The title of this talk is Bringing Nature to Everyone's Doorstep Experience with the 330-300 Rule for Greener and Healthier Cities. Uh, this is this is an idea that I think has been picked up by the mainstream media in interesting ways. So uh, I'll just give a little background here that Cecil shared with us. So in February of 2021, Cecil launched a new evidence-based guideline for the greening of cities. The so-called 330-300 rule calls for everybody to have at least three well-established trees inside of their homes, schools, and workplaces, a minimum of 30% tree canopy coverage at the neighborhood level, and no more than 300 meters, or just over 300 yards for us uh, Americans. Uh, oops, just lost my train here. Uh, to the nearest public green space. The rule has helped stimulate the debate about the importance of trees and nature for our health and well-being, as well as for climate action. It is now being implemented by cities and organizations across the globe. Uh, in today's talk, Cecil will present the motivation and evidence behind the rule, some initial experience with its implementation, and opportunities for using it to promote a nature-based thinking approach to urban planting. Uh, so before we begin, Cecil, I don't know if uh, you prefer people save their questions till the end or um, interrupt you, up to you, but we will have time at the end for questions. Yeah, maybe maybe at the end is, is great. If, if somebody really has an urgent question, feel free to interrupt as well. But I don't think I can be, I will be able to see the chat as I present, so. I will keep track of the chat for you. Right. Um, and if something urgent comes up, I will let you know, but otherwise I will collect those thoughts for the end. That sounds great, thank you. All right, with that, uh, the stage is yours. Perfect, thanks so much. And thanks for uh, for giving me the chance to uh, to be with you today. And it's, it's nice to see many familiar faces. Can you see my slides? Yep, yes, okay. can. Yeah. Perfect, wonderful. Yeah, so thanks David for the introduction and also telling a little bit about this uh, rule or rule of thumb or guideline. It has been called many things and uh, it's on purpose that I've called it a rule to kind of stimulate the debate, the debate a little bit about green and trees in cities. And as you will see, as I go through the presentation, uh, although there is a, a good evidence base that supports it, really my main motivation has been to actually really stimulate the debate uh, about trees and nature in cities, uh, especially among people that are maybe not so directly involved in it. So um, and actually my experience so far has been that there's a lot of interest from politicians. Uh, there's a lot of interest from uh, planners, from engineers, from architects which is great because it really helps us uh, yeah, bring across some of the arguments about urban ecology and, and urban forestry, uh, urban nature in general to, uh, to those affiliated professions as well. Yeah. So of course, I mean, I don't say anything new if I say this is a, an, in a way a very exciting time for, for urban greening and urban nature. And of course we face a lot of challenges in terms of loss of habitat and biodiversity, but we also see a push now towards the greening of cities. Um, I'm actually at the conference here in Wroclaw in Poland at the moment. Uh, 200 people, Polish colleagues, who are all concerned in some way with keeping trees healthy in cities. And uh, I can almost literally move to another conference every single week where there is a, a focus on, on urban forestry and urban green and urban nature, especially here in Europe. There's really a, a booming industry around this right now as well. Uh, and of course, this relates to anything from more classical urban forestry approaches to, uh, to green walls, living walls, green roofs, high-tech greening that is also becoming more and more common. The building on the right is, is a building at the Floriade Expo in Almir in the Netherlands, uh, just closed this summer. But this is actually a, a high a university, a polytechnic, that actually is, is green inside and outside um, and actually educates green uh, professionals as well. So it's a really nice kind of link between learning in green for green uh, as well. And of course, I mean, one of the reasons why we see, I think, uh, a bit of a heightened interest, and we heard, I mean, that we talk about Boston, there's quite a few cities across the world that actually are really pushing forward green agendas pretty aggressively right now. Uh, often these are, of course, the larger cities, the more ambitious cities, the cities that have resources, but also smaller cities sometimes are trying to, uh, to do things differently. And, and one of the reasons is obviously climate change. Um, 
as you also seen in the US, of course, with the, the inflation bill, right? Climate is a very important argument for greening of cities. But also the whole uh, COVID-19 pandemic, of course, has really uh, yeah, given us more focus again on, on, on the near, uh, near green spaces that we have, the trees in our street. Uh, places like uh, Vancouver, where I lived during the pandemic, they, uh, they closed off several streets during, uh, during that time. So that people actually had kind of instant parks uh, with, with the wonderful street trees around them. Um, so yeah, you see these kind of developments also in Barcelona are really interesting to, uh, to uh, follow. And of course, this has led them to kind of a reappreciation of nearby nature and kind of a mainstreaming, I would almost say, um, which you see uh, also in places like China, in the Middle East, uh, Latin America more and more. Um, but of course, this also calls them for, for yeah, good professional approaches towards governance, planning, management. Uh, we need good leadership, of course, around green in cities. And we also need to make sure that actually the experts on um, green management and, and ecology and so are involved. It's not only the, the people that are maybe coming from peripheral uh, <laughs> fields that are driving this forward. And of course, globally, there's a lot of uh, links as well in terms of the sustainable development goals that you're probably all very familiar with where uh, Sustainable Development Goal 11 is specifically targeting green spaces um, amongst uh, the sustainable cities and communities uh, the targets, uh, but also things like climate and health once again. And of course, I mean, we know that our world is rapidly changing. This is just a few images, um, the hurricanes. And so we've seen, of course, in, in uh, also recently in North America, but also heat waves that we've faced in Europe. This is a picture from this summer where the UK, for example, hit 45 uh, centigrade, which was an extreme temperature uh, for, for them. Uh, and of course, these heat waves are leading to excess deaths. A lot of people actually have died in addition to the usual uh, mortality, but also things like actually trees being uh, pushed to the limits because they're not really very happy in this uh, very dry and warm conditions. And then also, of course, we've seen a lot of focus on, on things like nature-based solutions, nature solving our issues <laughs> in a way. Uh, in the US, of course, you have also the, the phenomenon of natural climate solutions, a little bit similarly, um, I think targeting uh, yeah, the role of nature and, and trees and vegetation in addressing some of the major societal challenges. And then, of course, I mean, uh, initiatives like the Biophilic Cities Network, um, all kinds of new planning approaches, green urbanism, etc. There's really a wave, I would say, of, of all kinds of interesting new ways of looking at cities in, in more green, holistic ways. And my own uh, background, and uh, Susan is also on the call, Susan Day, and my colleague at UBC, um, my own background is more in, into urban forestry. So I came more from a forestry background, but moving into the city. So I'm also very interested in street trees and, and uh, urban parks, et cetera. But, but of course, here we really try to deliver these nature-based solutions through trees and associated vegetation uh, to the communities that live there. And sometimes we, uh, we also have to keep stressing that, of course, I mean, this idea of, of nature providing all kinds of services is really not new. And in the US, of course, you've had your shade tree conventions, for example, for many, many years, a kind of a predecessor, I would say, of all these nature-based solutions discussions that we see now. Uh, and these are actually only occurring for the last maybe 10 or 15 years. And of course, here, we always have to remember also we're work really working with a continuum uh, from, from inner city urban forests to peri-urban areas of peri-urban woodlands, but also, of course, more remote uh, nature areas, forested areas that are actually also heavily impacted by urban values and urban audiences. So, I mean, not seeing this as continuum, I think, would be a really big mistake. So this is kind of a background also to the, to the rule in a way, because the rule is urban focused, but can definitely also be applied more broadly. Uh, just another example of how uh, how we really see more attention for urban 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 green in general. Uh, this is a piece of work I did together with the United Nations recently on uh, providing some kind of policy guidance for urban forestry and, and kind of these nice illustrations of some of the benefits that urban forests can provide if they're managed in a, in, a, in a good and sustainable way. So this is a little bit of background context. Um, and then I think during my career, which spans now almost 30 years almost in urban forestry, uh, one of the things I've, I've often heard from policymakers, from, from politicians, from colleagues is like, what can we do? Right? Can we make, can we package all that information that's out there? And we have more and more good research that shows the, the benefits of, of green and the need for green. How can we bring that into kind of a policy framework and, and guideline framework? Uh, and that adds, of course, also to the idea of, of kind of overwhelming um, problems in terms of climate change, this climate anxiety issue where people feel oh, this, this is too big an issue. We cannot really do anything. Uh, what can we do as, as individuals to actually make it work? How, we, how can we be less overwhelmed by it? Uh, this is uh, through science. I actually took photos of at the Floriade Expo this summer in the Netherlands, 
uh, these are kids writing, uh, they had to put their wishes for the world on, on little pieces of, uh, of bark. And, and they write here, like, I wish that trees could live longer, which is kind of, in a way, what urban forestry is trying to do as well, which is, uh, I think, nice to see. And I think that the idea of kind of packaging information is not only uh, related to science, it's also related to what, what, for example, urban forest managers are doing more and more. Uh, Toronto, and I think Boston is another great example, uh, are trying really to, to boil down the key messages from their strategies and plans into almost like a one pager or a poster that shows like, what, what are we going to do over the next 10 to 15 years, or even longer? And of course, in urban forestry, a, a very well-known rule or actually guideline is Frank Santamore's 10 20 rule uh, for tree diversity stating that we should never have much more than 10% of the same tree species, uh, not more than 20% of the same genus, and not more than 30% of the same family. And this, although it's, it's kind of a rule of thumb, and that, I mean, there's some research behind it, but not that much, but it has become highly influential uh, across the world, actually. Many people working with trees in cities can, can uh, cite this rule and actually sometimes use it as well. So that's a bit of background to my 33300 uh, rule, and this is really literally a, a moment of almost serendipity where I was standing and reflecting on new studies coming out from Australia, especially that, that kind of repeatedly showed that the 30% canopy cover is really where you start seeing health benefits kick in. Uh, mental health, but also things like a better birth weight of children, uh, better general health. And then I also had recently re uh, read a report by the World Health Organization that says, well, if you're living about a five minute walk away, maybe a 10 minute walk away from a park, and they say 300 meters, right? So it's like 330 something yards then you actually are more likely to use that park or green space, and also you're more likely to be in a better health. So all of a sudden there's 3,300. And then I was also seeing studies coming out about visible greens, so more and more focus on being able to see trees, to see green space from your window, and uh, the impact it had on people uh, in terms of their mental health. A recent study actually by Matilda van der Bos in, uh, in Spain shows that people in Spain during the lockdown who had a view of trees were two and a half times less likely to have depression uh, during COVID. So pretty strong evidence that shows, I mean, that we, if we can see trees, we can see green from our windows, from the places where we study or work, that we're actually in better health and, and well-being. So I already yeah, introduced the rule briefly, and, and David also did. So uh, this came out in February last year. I made a, a, a little blog post on LinkedIn, and then IUCN, uh, their urban program, picked it up very quickly and also reposted it. And then based on that and a few social media posts and some imagery, this is from my, my home in Barcelona, and I'm showing the three components. Uh, it re went really very quick. I, I would say it really went, uh, it went kind of viral. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit more about, about that, but just a bit more about the evidence. So yeah, I said the visible green, more and more research showing, of course, the health benefits in general of trees and green space. Um, more and more good studies coming out in great journals, good medical journals as well. Uh, this, this is really influential work, I think, by Thomas Astelbert and colleagues in, in Australia. And they repeatedly found for different health indicators, this 30% uh, greenness or canopy as really a cutoff point almost. So if you hit that level in your neighborhood, then you see some of those benefits really become uh, substantially higher. Then also some recent work in Leuven in Belgium uh, that showed actually it's not so much maybe about the number of trees, but it's really about having some well-established uh, healthy trees. Uh, so if, if people can see you good, good sized trees, uh, healthy trees, then their health benefits will be higher as compared to just having a lot of trees that are smaller, maybe not so well established. Um, and this is work that was related to mental health specifically. Uh, I was also interviewed for that. I was actually in Leuven then for a few months. And of course I had a chance there also to pitch the 33300 idea saying, well, you know, the 30% canopy is not dependent on the number of trees, obviously it's dependent on having some larger trees with good canopy sizes. So we need to really take care of our trees and make sure they survive beyond those typical what is it, 25, 30 years, um, which is more common in urban areas. And then this work is also, I think, very influential by Carly Zeter, a professor at Concordia University in Montreal, who did uh, some pretty detailed work on cooling effect of canopy. And she found 40% uh, as kind of a, a cutoff point. So you have to have hit 40% before you really see the cooling uh, effect strongly taking, uh, taking place. 40% is very high for European cities, it's, uh, it's maybe unrealistic, right? Currently, we are in Europe around 20% in most cities. Um, parts of the US, of course, are much higher. I saw a recent study that showed, I think, Charlotte, North Carolina had the highest canopy cover, was it 56%, which is for, for Europeans, it's, it's incredibly high. 
Yeah, and then the 300 meters, as I mentioned, the World Health Organization has um, has set a, a limit of 300 meters, um, and there's more and more work coming out that really says, yeah, maybe between between three to 500 meters is a good distance for people to uh, to regularly use local public green spaces. And this is a study a little bit older from Denmark that showed if you live more than a kilometer away, so it is that less, yeah, a little bit over half a mile, then you're actually much less much less likely to be in, in good physical health, for example. So the more you're stimulated to use parks and green space, the healthier you will be. But of course, it depends very much where you are in the world. So this is Barcelona, I've taken from Paraguay. Um, which is a wonderful city, but it's also not very green because it's very dense. It's an old town, etc. So to bring in green space here and to have visible green space, so maybe maybe a bit of a challenge. Well, for example, in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, uh, there are areas where it's much greener and you have good visual access to trees. But also here, uh, average canopy cover is actually just a little bit below twenty percent. So not very high for a, for a city located in a temperate rainforest, maybe. And then another place where I have recently worked a little bit is Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, where canopy coverage is shocking 0.5%, um, very low. And of course, we are in the desert here. But actually, there's a very ambitious program now to uh, raise that, increase that to 9% canopy cover, which of course can yeah, cause us all kinds of discussions in terms of water, um, finding suitable species, maybe not only trees, but also shrubs and, and kind of wadi vegetation. Uh, but water actually uh, turns out that 85% of the water is not recycled currently, uh, water from air conditioning, water from uh, showers and households. So the, there's quite a potential actually to, to use that water much more efficiently. And um, another, I mean, important thing is also a word of caution, right? Not just implementing 330, 300 can of course be very dangerous as well. If you just think about using a single tree species or just masses of green, as we've seen in Amsterdam here in the Balmer, Amsterdam Southeast, where they did actually basically a 330-300 way before the rule existed, but they ended up with a very unlivable uh, housing area, very unsafe, the green was really a barrier. Uh, so you have to, of course, work very carefully with design, with species selection, with ecology, and of course with local communities to make sure you add quality as well as quantity. And of course, then another question I often get when I present about this is, yeah, well, what do we do? We have these dense cities, places like Barcelona, where there's really no space. So what can you do? Well, you can take car habitat, for example, as Barcelona is now doing, closing off its streets and, and planting new trees. You can go vertical, you can go on buildings, as we see with the vertical forests. Uh, you can, uh, of course, re let forests regrow. You can have pocket forests, a tiny forests. So there's all kinds of approaches now that are not only bringing trees into cities, but also actually widening, I think, the whole idea of what is a forest? Uh, how many trees do you need to have? What is, what is the ecological process involved? And of course, the work of people like Professor Suzanne Simart and so about how trees communicate with each other and how they interact with each other also in cities can really be very, uh, very influential in, in redesigning our cities, I think, from that perspective. So just a little bit about uh, yeah, what, what's happening now with 330-300 since I launched it. So my, my tweets, uh, so they were that it went viral, I said, so I've never had more than a few thousand reactions on a post, but all of a sudden I had 60 plus thousands. Um, and this started really living a, a bit of a life of its own. So there were TV programs that picked it up quite interesting, which is a UK science program posted about it and got 4,000 reactions on Facebook. Um, and then what I think is a really wide, important lesson is that some of those champions and social media influencers, they picked it up, journalists and, and uh, well-known urban planners. And with that actually really uh, made the exposure exponential and all of a sudden people were talking about it, um, which, which was really interesting to see for me as somebody who is, who is in social media, but not I mean, doesn't have such an extremely strong following. But from there on, it went very quick. So there's a lot of focus from cities, uh, but also international organizations. Organizations like Greenpeace picked it up in, in Latin America and in Spain. So there was even a protest action in Madrid uh, where they closed off one of the main uh, squares in Madrid um, and, and asked for more green in the city and actually asked for 330, 300. And this all happened within just a couple of months, actually, after the rule was, uh, was launched. Uh, the World Economic Forum picked it up, which was also very surprising. I all of a sudden saw this vi video circulated where my name was on, I had no idea about. Um, but it really showed, I think, and, and I think that's the thing I really want to say, is that there was a, a need for kind of a platform, um, some kind of discussion platform or, uh, or, or slogan in a way that really raised the interest for trees and cities. And, and I think that was really the, the big gain here. The people started talking about it. Um, and that, that really made me also thinking that sometimes you know, we have all the evidence and all the complex research, but is there a way that we can actually package it in, in, in a still responsible way 
uh, and of course with all the nuances, but that, that really then helps actually to provide a common um, common point of discussion. And everybody, of course, will easily remember 330, 300 in that sense as well. It's maybe a bit gimmicky. I do understand that. And, and, and I started off, I'm, most of my life I've been an academic, but as a consultant now, of course, you can easily be seen as somebody who, uh, yeah, who tries to, to sell things. Um, so of course, there's always a bit of a trade-off there between simplification on the one hand, on the other hand, maybe having too much complexity, which also doesn't move things forward. And there is a decent evidence base, and I'll show you a new study that just came out from Barcelona as well, that actually shows that this is not completely uh, crazy to, to use this rule. Um, and then, of course, it's always important to yeah, make, make it their idea, right? The politicians, for example, there's quite a few of them that are really interested and in, are working with this now, and, and they kind of claim it as their own idea, which honestly, for me, is absolutely fine. So this is really a, a debate that is, uh, is underway. And I think one, one thing that I really also reflected on is that the, the, the number three is really something for us humans, of course. There is a, a lot of history, a lot of culture, a lot of religious connotations to it, um, which, which in a way is a bit of a lucky strike, right? If, if it would not have been uh, the number three there, I think it may, be, may have been more, more easy to forget the rules. So, so yeah, there's, there's a bit of a kind of an interesting communication and cultural aspect to this as well. Um, and yeah, if you Google it, so I've, if, when I Googled 33300 early on in the process, uh, the main 33300 rule actually relates to work, workplace strategy to how you uh, should, should spend your money as a, as a business or organization in terms of, for example, how much office space you need to have, how much money you should spend on utilities. But actually, if you Google it today, uh, the, the 33300 green rule comes up pretty high. So that has actually pretty much overtaken this, uh, this workplace rule, which is a little bit interesting. And then there was actually also 330, 300 rule for beer, allegedly, uh, about how long, how many hours you can keep beer uh, at, at, in a decent quality, depending on the temperature. So there's, uh, it was definitely not the first time 330, 300 was used as a, as a rule. Implementation has started, which is really interesting. So uh, first of all, there's been a lot of media attention, as David was already saying. These are just some of the, the stories. Uh, Arbor Day, for example, uh, ran a, a really nice story, but also big newspapers like The Guardian. Uh, big, big media organizations have run it. We, we wrote some uh, blog posts in big newspapers in, in European countries as well. That has really, I think, helped to, um, to kind of yeah, raise the debate further. You've seen this one. Sorry, this double slide. Um, and then I think yeah, the, the most interesting thing is that this is not only cities that are picking it up, but it's, it's international organizations, it's not-for-profits, it's political parties, quite a few of them. And I'll give you yeah, just an example in, in a bit. Um, trying to find ways of making, a, making nature communicable in a way. So to kind of use uh, a rule like 330-300 to start a debate about the importance of nature near where people live. So several cities uh, were quick out. So for example, St. Petersburg, Florida was one of the first to, uh, to actually integrate 330-300 in their urban forestry strategy. Uh, Saanich in British Columbia was another one. Uh, and there's actually now quite a few uh, cities across Europe as well that are using it. And almost every, uh, every week I hear one or two new cities that are interested in using it or are starting to use it as a, as a benchmark or a target uh, or sometimes even more in their, in their policies and strategies. Uh, the UN has said is, is working with this, is recommending it now as well to their uh, member states, in, especially in the European economic region. Uh, this is a little graphic they came up with. But, but to be honest, I mean, any good idea, right, I guess is, uh, is a lot, of course, borrowed from other good ideas. And, and one of the really inf influential ideas I picked up on early on is that the city of Frederiksberg in Denmark, a few years back, in their urban forestry policy or their tree policy, were calling for every citizen to have a view of at least one tree. Uh, and that was then seen actually in Denmark as quite an innovative uh, thing to, to say that. And I think they ended up with about 95% of the people having visual access to at least one tree, which was... Uh, it's pretty hopeful as well. And this is from recent elections. So in, in Sweden, we had a national election uh, where two of the eight biggest parties actually had 330-300 as a part of their program. Uh, they both lost, unfortunately. We had a, a government change in Sweden. We went pretty far to the right. Um, but even some of the, yeah, let's say more um, uh, less traditionally environmentally friendly parties are picking it up because they can actually see the benefit of, of greening uh, cities as well. Uh, in, in Toronto right now, there's a mayoral race going on. I think the election is actually coming up next week. And the number two candidate at the moment, uh, who is at 22 or 24% now, uh, Gil Penelosa, he has made 330-300 as part of his uh, campaign and platform as well. And he wants to introduce it to the city of Toronto. And then also very exciting, I think, was that in Scotland, um, uh, just a, a few months ago, they started uh, 
using money, uh, about 10 million British pounds. So this is a little bit, yeah, a little bit more in US dollars for implementing 33300 across the country in, in different Scottish cities. And we're actually now doing a feasibility study for that for them. And of course, then the next question is always, how do you measure it? And, and uh, the nice thing here is a bit of a bottom-up uh, wiki approach. So a lot of companies and, and organizations have jumped on it and are trying to assess it in their own way. Uh, I've had some discussions with them. I'm not working exclusively with anybody specifically, but here are just a few of the partners I've been working with. Um, and of course, the 30% canopy is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, the 300 meter at 330 something yard is also pretty straightforward, but here it's really about the actual route that people take. So not just as the crow flies, uh, but it can be done with GIS analysis. I think the tricky one has been the three trees. Uh, there has been some effort to use maybe Google Street View or similar, or even LiDAR, uh, and that will be developed further. But I think right now it's often done by taking a buff in an individual building, a buffer of maybe 25 meters, uh, and then seeing how many canopies of a certain size, for example, 25 square meters, you'll find in that buffer, and then you count those as visible trees of a, of a well of a well or decent size. So there's ways, of course, that one has to work right now with, uh, with the rule. But having said that, there is there's some good evidence. This is from Europe, three European cities by the World Health Organization that shows that uh, yeah, in many cities in Europe, at least the majority of the people has access to urban parks within 300 meters. Uh, another recent study by IS Global in Spain shows, though, that 60% of Europeans does not have uh, good access to green spaces. And that leads to 43,000 access deaths per year which is uh, pretty interesting to see that actually there is such a strong link between availability of green space and, uh, and health. This is an example of an analysis done in the Netherlands. This is the city of Utrecht. I'm actually going to move to later this year. Um, and here you can see, so the dark, the red areas are areas where people don't see uh, more than three or three trees or more. And the dark green areas is where people see three trees or more. Uh, they're still working with the analysis. There's this company called Cobra. Um, but they have done maps for all the cities in the Netherlands where you can actually see the three, the 30, and the 300 worked out. And a lot of cities are now working with that and prioritizing uh, where to put new green spaces, where to, uh, to focus. Uh, and this, of course, can be overlaid with things like uh, social economic maps. And so, so typically in, in Utrecht, for example, on the left side here where you see all the red, this is also where the more socially deprived areas are. So, of course, something we also know very well from, from the U.S. This is a canopy, and this, of course, looks pretty shocking. It's very red, so hardly any part of Utrecht, in this case, has 30% canopy, and this is very typical for the Netherlands, where we have an average of 16, 1.6% in our cities, so it's very low canopy, which is very problematic in a country which is uh, pretty strongly affected by climate change, uh, strong heat waves, a lot of issues with heavy rainfall, so I think canopy is going to be a big focus in the Netherlands over the next uh, few years. And then finally, 300 meters to the nearest park, a bit more positive picture. Uh, and here you see, for, again, the scent is the historical center, where obviously uh, there may be a little bit less access, but then if you go to the more, a little bit more suburban areas, actually people have pretty good access to, uh, to nearby parks. Uh, so recently, some, some, I wrote an article providing some of the, the evidence base. This is open access, so you can, you're very, very welcome to check it out. But what I really found interesting is a study from Barcelona by a group of um, people at the IS Global Institute. And they made a proxy analysis for 33300 and found uh, a significant link between mental health and having 33300 in place. So there is definitely more and more evidence now that actually starts to, to point out that there is something to this rule. There is something that we can, can work with. Uh, what I also really like is the citizen science component. So people, of course, can, can easily work with that. Uh, you can ask people to how long does it take to walk to the nearest park. You can ask people to look out of the window and count the number of trees as they did here. In, uh, in a few cities and, uh, and Greenpeace in Spain did that and asked 5,000 people in Spain how many trees they could see. And they ended up, I think 70% of people could see three trees or more, but actually quite a few people could not see a lot of trees. We're doing some work in Florida right now with a representative sample as well, where the majority of people has actually good visual access to trees in, in Florida. And this is some work in, in uh, Belgium, in the Brussels region. And, and it's also really nice to see it's not only uh, public governments or agencies that are working with this. This is a citizen group that wanted to uh, create cool cool spots in the city. So they use 33300 for finding or developing cool spots uh, everywhere in, in their community. Yeah, so, so finally, just a few um, few lines. So I, of course, it's very important to, to stay nuanced. So um, 
course, I often get the, the question, well, why three trees? And of course, three, the three tree part is, is the weak spot in the formula, absolutely. Um, but of course, it's a proxy for yeah, making sure we have visible green. And of course, trees are very, very visible, especially when they're well established. Um, but I think really the, the key point is that for me, it has been a great way to start a debate, uh, start a heightened attention for the role of trees and nature in cities, and to link it, of course, as well to specifically public health and to climate adaptation. Uh, and that has really, I think, resulted now in, in some mainstream political parties and so starting to be interested in trees and linking it to, to the climate adaptation agendas, public health agendas, uh, economic development agendas. And of course, as we go along, as the evidence develops further, and this will be tested now in new studies, we can, of course, start nuancing and refining. Because another important part, of course, is it doesn't always work with 33200 in, in any context. Uh, depends where you are in the world. Are you in a desert climate? Are you in a in a climate actually where 30% where canopy is not ambitious enough? Uh, can you work with other types of vegetation? Um, so my principle is always to say, well, start with trees. Uh, if trees are really not realistic uh, for different reasons, then start thinking about other types of vegetation that are more maybe locally appropriate, but really try to, uh, to maximize your ecosystem services. So yeah, it has been an interesting journey so far. And uh, it's really nice, I think, that it has been picked up by many organizations and that many also people are using it as, as it is their own. And I just want to yeah, stimulate that uh, discussion and the further development of that debate. I think, uh, David, I'll leave it at that so we have some time for a discussion. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and it left us with plenty of time, not only fodder for discussion, but plenty of time for discussion. So I want to open it up here to questions. Uh, you can unmute yourself or actually raise your hand, um, ask a question or drop it in the, in the chat window. Well, I have a question, um, and um, I and this is a question that we often encounter in in Boston and other cities as well. Is how do you def how do you draw a boundary around what counts as a neighborhood, right? For uh, thirty percent, so uh, that's also a political act, right? So how do you define it, or how is it defined in, in the research you're talking about? Um, yeah, I'm curious great, to hear great, that. Great question, David. That's that has been one of the key issues. Um, so the company in the Netherlands that has been making these assessments, they actually use a very um, very pragmatic approach. So I think they use a buffer of, I think it's one kilometer or maybe one mile from, from the home. So actually you don't have actual neighborhoods, but you kind of get a, a roaming area from the home rather than maybe a, a well-defined neighborhood. Uh, in some cases you can delineate neighborhoods because there is actually a very strong um, existing structure around it. Um, uh, sometimes you can use postal codes, for example, that we have been doing in Vancouver a little bit. But it's definitely an issue. But but of course, here the idea is that it should be your kind of daily roaming space, basically, um, that should be included in that. Interesting. So it actually can be um, dynamic and sort of static, right? That, that's that's and correct. Yeah. And I think it's a little bit similar also with the kind of built up area, like where do you draw the boundary for 33200, obviously. So yeah, that, that's another little bit of a technical question as well, I guess, to, to deal with. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Um, thank you for the presentation. I uh, wanted to ask what are maybe the implications of urban wildlife as a as a consequence or um, parallel topic to the 300 rule, um, and if there is an equivalent uh, wildlife um, rule uh, in in urban spaces as well. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Great, great question. I, I'm not aware of, of an equivalent rule, but of course, I mean, one of the, the principles kind of underneath it here is, is kind of connectivity. So, I mean, by implementing 33300 in, in a good way, by good design and planning, and, and you can actually start building better connectivity um, and bringing, of course, green all the way into neighborhoods. So in that sense, you would also promote uh, wildlife. There, there's somebody who suggested to add 3000 to it, to the rule which will be 3,000 square meters of, of uh, wilder vegetation in each neighborhood. So, so in that sense, you could actually start promoting wildlife as well. So it's not, it, it's inherently in there, but it has not been a main focus of, the, of, of this specific effort, I would say. The focus has really been public health and, and climate. Thank you. You're welcome. 
you know, this is not a hundred percent related, but it is related. Stella from Washington, DC. So very interested. Thanks. Great presentation. Um, I wanted to note that this Friday, we're going to have a bill presented in front of city council for bird protection measures. And one of the issues that's coming up is with the greater regreening of the city and planting of trees. I know you had Washington DC as one of your maps. There's also yeah. coming uh, increased conflict between the glass LEED certified buildings we have and the trees and, and the case of the birds flying into the glass. So I don't know if there's a rule. I think it would be great if there was something as handy as 3300, but accompanying this, I think we need to have measures of going along with protecting the wildlife that's going to be drawn to all those green spaces. I think that's a great point, Stella. And I mean, Vancouver, British Columbia has done some really nice work there, I think, in terms of having this cohabitation principle in their policies, right? So I mean, there have been major issues with, with coyotes and so, but, but the principle is always animals are there and we're going to live with them in our city. So, so I think something along that line, and if, if we could package that in some kind of principle or rule, it'd be actually really good. Oh, Sarah, sorry. Stella, you're muted. I'm sorry. I muted you. Can you say something more about the cohabitation principle? Yeah, so they have a, it's, it's a formal policy in, in the city of Vancouver where they have stated that, uh, that, that humans and animals actually have similar rights living in the city. So, so it means that uh, animals are not, not just removed, but they have a right to be in the city. And that could be yeah, pretty substantial, big animals roaming uh, mountain lions or, or bears coming into the city, for example. So, and, and there, the issue is always there to try to, to manage that rather than to say we have to remove the animals. So we have a question here in the chat and then um, I'll turn it over to Nova. Uh, so I'll read it from Pete Smith. Um, so does this rule mean all three components should be achieved or that achieving any one of them result in improved health outcomes for people? So there's, I don't know if I'd call it attention, right? To sort of work yeah. on what um, Pete is asking, Great. but sort of like you have, you have layers to this and, and which one should yeah. we prioritize or like how do they intersect? How do they intersect? Yeah, great, great question. Thanks, Pete. Wonderful question. And uh, I mean, the research where it's based on is based on the three components individually, right? So we have for all three, is there is research, especially for 30 and 300. Uh, the three trees per se, I mean, there's no studies, as far as I know, that actually have looked at the number of trees that we need to see, but we know that visible green is important for our health. There's more and more studies coming out on that. Um, then the study in Barcelona actually has combined the three components. So it's the first time that the three are actually taken as, as a whole. Um, and, and the initial findings show there's no synergy effect. So you actually by going for all three at the same time, you actually create added value because by having three trees visible, you probably also contribute to canopy. Uh, it will also make it easier for people to walk to the nearest park. So hopefully the synergy effect will actually come out of the research stronger as well. But, but the rule is developed on the individual components. And I would say out of those, my gut feeling is that so far the research points more towards the 30% as, as, as the essential part. So the canopy cover part is, is at least best documented in the research. But there's also a lot of work on, on uh, access to green space and, and walkability and things like that. So, but it will be really interesting now to see more research on, on the three components together. Uh, Nova? Um, hi, uh, great presentation. Um, I really like the kind of catchiness of the 330 and 300. Um, uh, my question is about whether this uh, uh, sort of this this talking point has spurred conversations about planting more broadly across all layers of the forest. You know, not just trees are part of the forest. There's also the herbaceous layer. There's also the shrub layer. Um, and I think. Uh, I, I think a lot about this because, um, you know, our forests are now, um, you know, have a deer problem. And so while we have like a pretty healthy canopy, our understory is just missing. Um, uh, but I'm also thinking about this on our streetscapes because we've got overhead wires and underground infrastructure and a tree is not possible in all these places. And so we're experimenting with just like rain gardens that are kind of at the, you know, you know, just just these herbaceous plants. So just curious about how how that's um, figured in. Yeah, th that's a really great point, Nova. Thanks so much for for raising that. So we're actually trying to uh, develop some some kind of manual, I would say, that actually starts talking about some of the underlying things you need to do. Right. So you have to build ecologically sound systems. You have to talk about tree diversity. You have to think about culturally appropriate species. You have to think about native species and and in some places exotic species. 
So, and I think, as you say, layering and structuring is, of course, showing, uh, shown in the literature to really help promote, for example, ecosystem services as well and biodiversity. So I think this is definitely a conversation that, that hopefully results from this. Um, I said trees, of course, are best documented in terms of ecosystem services, but underneath that, of course, things like shrubs and other vegetation also has a really important role to play. So, and the more layering you can do, I think, the, the healthier. Uh, Singapore has been doing some really great work along their avenues now, where they actually make kind of a linear forest, uh, which is layered and structured and has three or four layers of, of trees and shrubs. So I think that is probably something we're going to see more and more as well, that we go away from that kind of single layer single species uh, street tree planting, which I, I think from an ecological perspective is pretty pretty dire, right? We could do better than that. Thank you. You're welcome. So I have a question here from Ashley Trout. Um, wondering if anyone has assessed green job opportunities that come out of this 330, 300 hire, hiring, especially hiring underemployed or unemployed people to plant and maintain these trees. Oh, that's a great question, Ashley. Uh, not, not to my knowledge, but I know there are some kind of spin-offs developing as cities are now bringing this in. Uh, the example I know best of is, is the Scottish project where uh, money from actually from a, it's actually an oil company, so funny enough, but they actually start um, investing in clean energy. And one of the things they also want to do is a green city. So, so that money is actually coming in. It will create job opportunities. So that will actually generate new forestry jobs, uh, new community liaison officer jobs, et cetera. So, so that's the only direct example so far I know, but it will be really interesting to see as cities roll this out, what are the implications um, in terms of green jobs, but also maybe affiliate, affiliated jobs. Um, so yeah, definitely interesting to keep an eye on. Great. Uh, David, David Seifer. Hey, Cecil. Good to see you. And, and yeah. Always appreciate uh, the international perspective you bring to your presentation. It's it's Thank just you. inspiring, enlightening. And as I was thinking about your you know, 330, 300 rule, uh, one of the one of the biggest challenges we face in urban forestry is maintaining the, that infrastructure. And and so uh, I'm thinking a three percent budget. If 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 the message was not only you know provide this this access at at this density. But also, as cities are coming on board to commit to this, they're also committing to maintaining that that population of trees. And so, you know, in my in my work history, um, you know, I, I would I found have found that a three percent budget for for urban forestry across the entire operating budget of a city is a is a fairly substantial budget. And while it may not allow you to do everything, it's certainly higher than most cities uh, re, you know reside now. So um I'm, I'm going to take this and and, and kind of tweak it uh, uh in that respect and also with, with priorities for maintenance along a theme like this that i think can help can kind of i like the simple simplification of the message i think that is key to getting this uh getting this embraced uh, uh across our cities and so uh really really interesting concept i appreciate uh, the presentation Thanks so much, David. I, I love the idea of the 3% budget. Uh, it's excellent, right? I saw there was, there has been some discussion in, in some cities like New York, I think about a 1% budget for parks. Uh, I think Rich Howard's study showed that in the US, I think we're about 0.5% of budgets. So I mean, we have, we have quite a gap up and I think it's the same in Europe. We're often 0.3 to 1% of budgets, which is far too low, of course, for public health infrastructure, climate adaptation infrastructure. So, so I think that would be great to kind of link it up to the 3% budget. Yeah, one percent for parks is something here in Boston as well. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's a common sort of mantra in, in cities, at least in the United States. Question here from Lawrence: uh, Any book recommendations? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, specifically to three thirty three hundred, there are no books yet. There's a few articles I can uh, I can post the links to. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of excellent books coming out these days. Uh, some of them are are free, freely online, available. I think for urban forestry, one book that I've been personally involved with is the Rootless Handbook of Urban Forestry, which is kind of a nice uh, package of, of what's what's out there in terms of urban forestry. But, but as I said, there's a lot of free resources now available. Um, if you just want to read about interesting urban forest, I think Jail Jonas, uh, The Urban Forest, I mean, the history of the urban forest in the US and all the fashions involved and the people involved is a great read as well. So that yeah, just a few few reminders. And I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll put the link in the, in the, in the chat soon about, from the article. All right, my friend and neighbor, Becky. Hey, good to see you, Cecil. Um, Hi, Becky. 
thanks for your presentation. Uh, we kind of, other people kind of asked this question too, and it made me think of it, but there's a lot of competition in terms of um, nature-based resources or like hybrid resources. So for example, a lot of projects like have solar panels or rain gardens or whatever, and then people are like, oh, now can we have a tree? Oh yeah. <laughs> so like, what are some of your thoughts there? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Becky. Actually, I was, I've been in the Netherlands quite a bit recently, and there, this is a huge issue here. People starting to say, hey, I just installed solar panels, right? I, I've been stimulated to do it. And now you have these big trees starting to shadow them. So, so I think it, it, that's, that's like, I think the thing I try to say a little bit about careful planning and design and how we can try to create win-win uh, situations. And I think here, I think it's a combination, I guess, maybe of, of subsidies, subventions, maybe uh, inter yeah, but planning regulations in some cases as well, right? That we don't, I think one of the, the, the biggest danger I can see today is green competing with green in many ways. So we have uh, cycle paths versus trees. Or we have uh, uh, solar panels versus uh, vegetation, right? And it should not be like that, obviously. We should really try to, to make sure we're not starting to outcompete each other. Um, but it is, it is a tricky issue. It is a reality, definitely. Thank you. You're welcome. Brad? Uh, more of an observation, uh, just because I, I start, says I've watched maybe, I've probably seen you present on this maybe six times, and oh. um, probably since 2020, and I continually enjoy how big, it, I, I don't think people here appreciate how it's evolved, how how big it's gotten, how it's worked, and how it's taken off, and the whole um, the simplicity of it, it has really encouraged this, um, and I just, I'm and and the fact that you tweak it and show how this thing has evolved really is is it's so exciting. Um, and also, I'll tell Jill Jones that you uh, pushed her book on the uh, when I see her uh, next in next next couple of weeks. I'll tell her you were pushing her book. Wonderful, thanks, Fred. I really appreciate it. It's nice that you've been following this along. And and Jill definitely deserves that the book is book is pushed. I really enjoy that very much. There's a, there's another book. Um, let me see if I can find it. See, let me see. Is it called Seeing Trees? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sonia, Sonia yeah. Dupelman, um, which is a That's lovely a great history of yeah. uh, comparing, I think it's um, New York City and um, Berlin. Berlin, yeah. History of Trees. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful book. Yeah. Oh, There's some really great books. A little more academic well. than, yeah. than Jill's book. We have a right. question here from Tara. Um, let me see. Thank you for your presentation. You mentioned early the importance of good governance. She's wondering if you have any recommendations or case studies demonstrating positive governance set up, setups or use of policy levers that have enabled 33300 or similar initiatives. And then she has a separate question, very separate, different question. Another question is, how do you see this rule applied in cities in developing countries that are urbanizing so rapidly? Yeah, great, great questions, both of them. So on the on the first, uh, it's still early days, as I said, but I've been directly involved in work in Birmingham, UK, uh, where we developed an urban forest master plan with a big 40-year time horizon. And one of the things is that 330 is built into that. So, uh, and that, that is then linked to things like community leadership, uh, governance structures, funding streams, and there's a whole suite of plans that comes with it. So, so I think that's one example of trying to use it really as an instrument within, of course, a wider uh, governance setup. And I think my experience is that it's easy to understand for people from different walks of life or community members, for uh, people from different parts of the city administration. So in that sense, it can help actually communication and, and coordination, I think, of efforts as well. And I said, this is just, in a way, just as easy to be related to as somebody living in a, in a neighborhood as, as somebody working in the engineering department of a city. So, so hopefully that, will, that kind of communication platform will help with good governance as well. So, and of course, it's accountability as well, something that can be monitored, can be measured, can be seen over time how, we, how the city is doing. And it can be pretty ruthless, of course, to see that they were actually losing on, on all three components or were actually winning in all three components. So. And then the second question, the developing countries, that's a really interesting one. I've had quite some discussions, especially with colleagues in Latin America, a little bit in Asia as well. Some of the Brazilian cities are starting to work with it. Um, there are challenges, but on the other hand, they also often have pretty strong uh, remnant vegetation, uh, kind of leftover wildscapes and so that are actually can, can mobilize now as well. Canopy cover is of, often pretty decent. The challenge is often in the, in the kind of the favelas, the slums, uh, but even there, uh, there are opportunities, of course, at least to start raising the bar a little bit. And uh, there's sometimes some really nice big trees in those favelas as well that provide a lot of canopy. Um, and I think, I mean, I always say it's, like, it's, it's a development tool. So even if you're far below 330, 300, you can actually set a, 
a course out to, to improve the situation and any new development, you can start implementing it to kind of raise the bar as, as you go along. But uh, yeah, it'd be really nice to see some good case studies in Latin America or other parts of the developing world as well. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so we're just about at 11. Um, time for one more question. There is one out there. Doing my, uh, I used to be a teacher. I'm doing my 15 seconds of silence <laughs> practice. I'm supposed to hold it till it gets awkward, and I never can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, uh, we are not meeting uh, in November, and you can blame Matt Spitzen for that because of the partners conference. Uh, but I encourage UEC folks to uh, convene in person. We did last year. It was great fun. Um, we'll get a thread going if people are going to the conference and want to meet up as part of UEC. Um, otherwise, uh, I will post this recording in the coming days. I wanted to thank Cecil for an amazing presentation, such an honor. Uh, to have you here and, and you know to be part of this conversation that's really elevated the importance of the work we do, I think, in positive ways. Uh, so thank you, thank you. Um, and with that, have a great have a great month, everyone. Thanks everybody and hope to see many partners. See you there. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.